So today I'm going to be doing a video on the two people behind the sides of the uh, United States of War. And that is Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis. So if I just do a video on the biographies of each man individually, Lincoln's one of them would be absolutely eternal. Jefferson Davis is a bit shorter. So I decided to split it. I'm going to do a video on both of them. Now, you can tell from the title. But it's just going to be them pre-Civil War. And in order to cut out all the non, all like non-relevant stuff in terms of family life and education and blah blah blah, I'm just going to do the political career pre-Civil War. And in Lincoln's case, I'm going to skip his presidency. I'm going to do a video on him at some point. Lincoln, I'm going to do a video on his career as a lawyer, and then president, on the same video, and then I also do a video on on Lincoln and Davis in their respective roles as president during this war, because Lincoln was president of the Union, United States, but Davis was president of the Confederacy. So, when Lincoln first came, because I'm, I'm going to start with Lincoln. When he first came into politics, the president of the U.S. was Andrew Jackson. His election being one of the craziest ones, well, not his election, the one before. In which he was a candidate, um, extremely chaotic. Anyway, um, Lincoln... He had some shared views with Jackson, but he disagreed with the view that government and economic enterprise should be different. Ja uh, Jackson was in the Democratic Party. Um, and I have here a quote from Lincoln himself. And get this, he says, The legitimate object of government is to do for a community of people whatever they need to have done, but cannot do it all, or cannot do so well for themselves in a separate and individual capacity. So what he's saying is that government should be involved in the economy. People, like people, politicians around that time, you may know, or Henry Clay, Daniel Webster. And these men were politicians, were politicians right alongside Lincoln. Is quite quite an achievement, I would say. Uh, Lincoln, like Clay Webster, thought that the Illinois and the West they needed help in terms of economic help. And well, this these they, they needed to become more developed. They needed they needed economic input so they could develop and become more advanced. I say. I would say. And because he shared the view of Clay and Webster, he joined the party, the Whig Party, WHIG. So he was a, a Whig member of the Illinois State Legislature, elected four times from 1834 to 1840, which is quite, quite a lot of time. He just threw himself into building, well, into, you know, using state funds to build railroads, highways, uh, highways, <laughs> highways uh, canals. And actually, uh, Whigs and Democrats, they, um, they passed bills together, um, but this panic of 1837, the kind of crisis, kind of stopped everything and led to most products being abandoned because they just couldn't keep up. And in this legislature he passed during the time, it was pretty clear that despite Lincoln, well, not liking slavery, because Lincoln is renowned as the guy who passed the 13th Amendment, ending slavery. He wasn't opposed to it. Like, he was opposed to the idea of it, but he didn't believe in it in, 
in abolitionism. I mean, I'll be really honest at some point, but the 13th Amendment, even that, said that slavery was still legal if it was a punishment for a crime. Well, yeah. So, like, they would go on to, you know, go on to Congress as a representative, not as a senator. And he would be a Congress from 1847 to 1849. He was the only person, well, the only yeah, person from the Whig Party to represent Illinois. And so he didn't get that much attention. He wanted a, a bill for some a small eman emancipation of people in the in the District of Columbia, Washington D.C. But it was only if the free white citizens would approve it. He's essentially saying. Oh yeah, people in the in the District of Columbia, they should totally like enslaved black people should totally be free. Of course, that's only the white people want it. White people don't want it. We don't have to worry about that. Um, Lincoln wasn't dumb. <laughs> I think that's an obvious point. But Lincoln knew his ambition. So he slowly, but surely, began shaping a president. He began um, just not only working on himself, but also assessing the political atmosphere at the time. And well, with the whole Mexican War, that was a, a huge point for Lincoln to try and, you know, launch himself. When he even challenged the president at the time, James K. K. Polk, uh, and he said that uh, Mexico had actually started the war by shedding American blood on American soil. Well, Lincoln wanted to to condemn Polk and to condemn the war, but also wanted to keep it going. So it's a way to appeal to a lot of people. So, you know, he's saying, oh, this war is terrible. We shouldn't have even started it. But now we're in it, we're in it for the win. And yeah, but the fact that he criticized the war didn't fall quite right with the people. So he lost power in it. And it seemed really dark for him. It didn't seem like he was going to amount to much. So for about five years, Lincoln lay low. But in 1854, when Stephen A. Douglas had this, passed this bill to Congress, that kind of reopened the Louisiana Purchase to slavery and allowed people from Kansas and Nebraska to decide if they would allow slavery in the territories. Well, this, this thing that I just mentioned had quite a lot of opposition in Illinois. And this Kansas-Nebraska Act was actually what led to the Republican Party after the Missouri Compromise, uh, which is kind of well the same thing I think it is. Well, this rise of the Republican Party um, was just people thinking like minded people, you know, and Lincoln, being one of those people, joined the the Republican Party. And, well, they began gaining prominence slowly, slowly, and slowly. Lincoln finally felt confident enough to go to Douglas and say, 
I'm going against you for Senate, Senator. And he ran for Senator in 1858. And they had these debates that, oh my God, I bet if they had television at that point, they would have been gold. Lincoln debating. Just imagine that. And it was just, it, if only they had recorded it, if only they could. Well, Lincoln was more like high pitched, he was nervous, awkward, Douglas, he was more tall, he was more confident, but he was no Lincoln in terms of quality of speech. Yeah, his state's presence, like state stage presence was he was great, but you need the speech. And these notes you can actually read them. Um they were published, the transcripts were published in 1860, along with a, a biography of Lincoln from with stuff compiled by Lincoln himself. And yeah, well, one of the quotes in those debates is, I mean, it's Lincoln, what else can you expect? It's, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe the government cannot endure permanent half slave and half free. So he said, and he predicted this, that things would become all one thing or all the other. Either the entire country believes the slavery should, you know, um, disappear. Well, the entire country should be listened to. So, slavery is either gone or it's there. You can't have full slavery. And he he believed with um, with Thomas Jefferson that. Slavery it was a problem, but it shouldn't be completely eradicated. It should be contained, controlled. So it's not as for the problem to not spread too far. Here is a a quote from Lincoln. I am not, nor ever have been, in, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. I am not, nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of black people, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together, on terms of social and political equality. This guy freed the, the slaves in 1865 because he had to, it was the pressure, not because he really believed it. When I was younger and I read about Lincoln, because we were never taught about him, I always thought he was this guy ahead of his time. Like pushing for social for um, social equality, civil rights. No. Slavery should be controlled, not abolished. And that really shocked me when I just the quotes that I just read your real Abraham Lincoln quote, which is quite shocking. Anyway. Despite everything, Lincoln did lose the election. He didn't win the seat for Senate. It is hard to defeat an incumbent. Thing is, he's like, don't never give up. Yeah, Lincoln lost the Senate uh, position, but he was not quite famous. Between his biography, between his Speech, um, yeah, speeches, debates. He was renowned enough for his name to be thrown around for president. 
and they were nominated for a third ballot at the Republican National Convention in Chicago. And well, he would be able to run for president. And he was elected. Yeah, that's on you for your presidency. I think the what you need to take away from Lincoln uh, for your president, the only thing you really need to know in terms of his political career is his stance on emancipation and abolitionism. And it's, yeah, that slavery is a problem, should be controlled, yes, but not eradicated. Literally, I heard the guy said that you cannot have yeah half slaves and half free, but you cannot have social and and political equality between black and white people. You cannot have black people voting or black people judging. Anyway. On to Jefferson Davis. Um, in 1845, uh, Lincoln at this time was already a prominent, uh, well not prominent, but he was already a politician. Davis, uh, pertaining to the Democratic Party, was chosen to present his, um, his seat in the House of Representatives. And he actually married a really young girl, 18 years old, no, 18 years old, no. Sorry. 18 years younger than him. 1846, he resigned his seat to serve in the Mexican uh, American War and actually became a huge hero after he won the Battle of Buena Vista in 1847. He returned, was extremely wounded, and finally went into the Senate. He ran for governor of Mississippi in 1851, but he um, lost. But Lincoln Peters said, you know, you just won. I need you in my cabinet. And decided to make Jefferson Davis the Secretary of War in 1853. And Davis actually made the army quite big, he um, made coastal defenses even better, and uh, directed three surveys for railroads to the Pacific. When, well, 1957, around the time that Pierce left office, Davis couldn't exactly stay in the cabinet, so he had to go back to the Senate. And he was an advocate for, because by that point, it was pretty clear that there were divides between the North and the South. And he thought, we shall yeah, unite and have some own ideas and be together and yada yada. He did not like um, Douglas. And actually supported so, uh, alongside many Southern Democrats, John C. Breckinridge. And he, what he wanted was a uh, kind of protection for slave holdings. It was really weird. Then um, South Carolina, when it withdrew from the Union in 1860, Davis was kind of, dude, why? We want unity, we just, that's what we want. And he knew that this new guy, um, Abraham Lincoln, he would crush the South if given the chance. He would just crush the South. And yeah, that is it. And with Jefferson Davis, there's not much to go on pre presidency. I mean, there's obviously a bit more, but that's for the video of them as president rather than anything else. Yeah, we'll leave it there. Kind of chaotic, I guess. Because there's a lot of names, a lot of dates, a lot of whatever. And also, it is later than usual.
so I'll play it on that. And yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there. Tomorrow I'll do a video on either Jefferson Davis or Abraham Lincoln and their presidency. So yeah, I hope you liked it. I hope you found it interesting. And thank you for watching. Bye.